In this video, we are going to discuss about transient ischemic attack. So let's imagine your brain is like a busy city with lots of roads and traffic. Sometimes there might be a tiny bump in one of those roads and that's going to briefly slow down the traffic. That's the kind of what happens during a transient ischemic attack. So what is a transient ischemic attack? It's a brief episode of neurological dysfunction due to a temporary focal cerebral or retinal ischemia. But without an acute infarction. It usually lasts for seconds or minutes with complete recovery and it's often called mini strokes. A TIA is like a mini traffic jam in the roads of your brain. It's usually caused by a small blockage that momentarily slows down the blood flow and because of this temporary slowdown, some parts of your brain might not get enough oxygen for a very short time. But just like a speed bump, it doesn't usually cause a major problem. So a TIA doesn't usually cause a lasting damage. TIAs or transient ischemic attacks are produced by temporary ischemia to a vascular territory and it's usually caused by thrombosis or embolism and less commonly by vasculitis or hematological disorders. So when we are talking about the etiology and pathophysiology, by far the most common cause of a TIA is carotid atherosclerosis. So carotid atherosclerosis is a large vessel disease and if you guys can remember it's also the most common positive factor of strokes too and if it's an embolism that's usually cardiac in origin and it could be due to a post myocardial infarction atrial fibrillation valvular disease or prosthetic valves this cardioembolism usually occurs in the branches of middle cerebral artery for hematological disorders the patients might be having polycythemia and sickle cell disease. Vasculitic causes like polyarteritis nodosa, cranial arteritis and syphilis can also cause TIA. So what is the problem in here? The problem occurs when there's an emboli or a plaque in the carotid artery and that eventually leads to an impaired perfusion of the brain tissue. The focal neurological symptoms produced by this ischemia will depend on the area of the cerebral circulation involved. These patients will present with vision problems, contralateral hemiparesis, hemianesthesia, aphasia, gait disturbances, dizziness and vertigo. And if you auscultate, you can hear a carotid breathe. The vision problem in these patients is also known as amaurosis fugax. It's a transient monocular blindness that is often described as a gray shade being pulled down over the eye and it's caused by retinal ischemia, most often due to a cholesterol emboli originating from the carotid artery. So now let's talk about the risk factors. The risk factors can be divided into modified and non-modified risk factors. The modified risk factors are alcoholism, hypertension, smoking, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, obesity, stress, and atrial fibrillation. Non-modifiable risk factors are age, family history, and male sex. Diagnosing a TIA is very important. The significance of a TIA is not the symptoms that it produces, but the risk for future events it portends. So we use a scoring system called ABCD2 to triage the patients with TIA to assess their risk for recurrent events within the first three months, because most of these events occur within the first two days. So what is this ABCD2 score? A is for age more than 60 years. They get a score of 1. B for blood pressure more than 140 by 90. And they get a score of 1. C for clinical symptoms. If the patient is having unilateral weakness, you get a score of 2. If they have speech disturbances but without weakness, you get a score of 1. D for duration. If the event occurred for more than 60 minutes, that gets a score of 2. If it's in between 10 to 59 minutes, it gets a score of 1. The second D is for diabetes. If the patient has diabetes, they get a score of 1. By looking at the total score, you can predict their 2-day stroke risk. A total score of 6 to 7 is high risk, 4 to 5 is moderate risk, and 0 to 3 is low risk. Diagnosis and investigation. The workup for a TIA begins with a history and physical examination. So take a detailed history from the patient or if possible from a witness. We need to know about the onset, cause, 
duration of symptoms and if they have any atherosclerotic risk factors and relevant medical history like atrial fibrillation or if the patient had a myocardial infarction before or if they have valvular heart disease. Physical examination should begin with blood pressure in all four extremities and we should also include a fundoscopic examination to check the eye. You have to do the auscultation for bruise, cardiac murmurs and assess the cardiac rhythm and check if they have any evidence of embolic events to the other parts of the body and go through a complete neurological examination in these patients. Carotid Doppler and magnetic resonance angiography are effective non-invasive imaging studies and they are often used as first-line diagnostic tools. And we also have to check a complete blood count, fasting lipid profile, serum glucose levels and erythrocyte sedimentation rate especially in elderly populations to evaluate for temporal arteritis. 12 lead ECG must be obtained to evaluate for atrial fibrillation and echocardiogram can be useful to evaluate for valvular or mural thrombi. A non contrast CT of the brain must also be performed initially. After specialist assessment in the TIA clinic, we can consider doing an MRI to determine the territory of the ischemia or to detect hemorrhage and other alternative pathologies. Management. These patients require urgent admission. Patients who have more than one TIA within a week and have ongoing neurological symptoms, have severe cardiac stenosis or if you are suspecting for a cardiac emboli, these patients require urgent admission. Apart from that, we have to control the cardiovascular risk factors in these patients by doing lifestyle modifications. So what are the lifestyle modifications? Cessation of smoking, reduction of alcohol consumption, increase in physical activity and dietary modifications. And next up in the management is stroke prevention. That begins with antiplatelet therapy. Aspirin is used in all cases unless there's a contraindication to the use. Aspirin for two weeks and then change to clopidogrel after that. So if clopidogrel is contraindicated, then we can go for aspirin with a slow release dipyridamol. A statin like simvastatin should also be started immediately and continued long term. So let's say this patient had a cardioembolism as a result of atrial fibrillation. So these patients need long term anticoagulation with warfarin to reduce the risk of systemic embolization. And they can also use new oral anticoagulants like dabigatran, apsixaban and rivaroxaban. Surgical procedures like surgical endarterectomy can be done for severe carotid artery stenosis and they actually have successfully reduced the long-term risk of stroke in both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. These patients should also be advised not to drive until the driving advice is given by the specialist team. So if you ever notice a momentarily glitch in your brain's traffic, don't ignore it. Let the experts take a look to keep your highway running smoothly. I hope you guys learned something today. And if you did, please hit the like button and comment your ideas. And subscribe to my channel for more content like this. And as always, thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next video.